Do you feel helpless as you watch the world spin out of control? Are you looking for ways to have an impact? Well, stay tuned for your marching orders in the culture war. You're listening to Activist Radio, the Mark Harrington Show, and you can support the program by going to createdequal.org. Today on the program, I have as my guest, Reverend Patrick Mahoney, and he is the director of the Christian Defense Coalition. Pat, thanks for being on the program today. Mark, thanks thanks for having me. Two things. First of all, I just put tape over the uh, timepiece, so I'm just going to keep on going, whether the <laughs> not. I just want everyone listening and watching, no mic drop. And why not Beatle bumper music? You're such a Beatle fan. Well, yeah, I, I'll devote another program to my uh, my like of the Beatles. In fact, I'm going to another tribute. In fact, you went to it, 1964. I'm going to go see them next week, just so you oh, know. They, they actually, listen. They're we good. Rapid trail. We don't have much time. It was great. So anyway. I enjoy it. I enjoy it. I enjoy Beatle music. That's right. So anyway, Patrick, we wanted to bring you on the program because you're there in Washington, D.C. And um, Pat and I go back, uh, way back, I guess, into, into the Operation Rescue days. How many times you've been arrested, Pat? Have you have you lost track? Um, you know, uh, Dr. Garlow asked me that in a program last night. It's either 109 or 110, but only for <laughs> okay. good things. Like but who's Arnold keeping Schwartz. track, right? Yeah, who's keeping track and seven million dollars in fines? <laughs> oh my gosh! Anyway, Patrick and I have been friends for a long, long time. Go back to Operation Rescue days, and Patrick's in the nation's capital uh, with his finger on the pulse of what's going on there. And we want to talk about that today here on Activist Radio, the Mark Harrington Show. First of all, I want to get your take on what's going on in Texas. You know, it's kind of come out of nowhere in a way, even though these heartbeat bills have been around for many years. In fact. We were, in fact, you came to Columbus when we, uh, we when we uh, introduced the first heartbeat bill in America in 2011. Ten years later, dozens of them have passed, but the one in Texas stands out, and it's because it's a little bit different. So, Patrick, I know the abortion advocates are going nuts over this. They're freaking out. In fact, I read today that nine out of the 17 abortionists that work for Whole Women's Health in Texas have quit, that they are no longer working for the uh, the abortion organization because they're afraid of getting sued. Uh, we've not seen anything like this in in really in the 50 years where we've been able to see a piece of legislation actually get signed into law and be in force. So as of today, uh, right now, that bill or that law is still being enforced in the state of Texas. What's your take on it? Well, first of all, I love what happened. There's a favorite word I have in the Bible. It's called suddenly. Uh, and suddenly mm-hmm. doesn't mean quickly. But when God moves, it's dramatic. It's powerful. And you're right, Mark. This was completely off the radar screen. People knew it was out there, but it was kind of hovering around. I think the pro-abortion people probably wish they would have taken a different legal Attack, but when they brought it up to the court, it first went to um, Gorsuch, and then the whole Supreme Court voted on it, and that's where like everything came unhinged for the pro-abortion movement. So, by a five-to-four decision, um, the justices voted not to block this ban. So, if we put our thinking caps on it, and we 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 want to realize there's a long road ahead of this uh, legislation, but you would figure if five justices voted not to block a law which banned abortion after six weeks, then the Dobbs v. Jackson case, uh, which bans abortions after 15 weeks, would hold. The bottom line is, Mark, this shows where the pro-life movement has always been its strongest. We are not a top-down movement. We are local. We mm-hmm. move yeah. in in communities like every parish has a pro-life group. They sell cupcakes. You have activists out on the streets where the pro-abortion side is extremely top down because they've had so many friends in the federal courts and in the federal government. So 
this is exciting from January 1st to June uh, 31st, 91 pieces of state legislation was passed, mm -hmm. pro-life pieces of legislation, the most ever for a one-year period, but it was in a six-month period. So there are these really exciting, creative, and you guys introduced it. Uh, mm -hmm. You, Janet Porter, uh, in Ohio, you, you kind right. of set the creative pace for focusing on the child. And, and Mark, that's what the final thing I want to bring out about the Texas case. It focused on the child, on the humanity of the child. The pro-life movement has always been pro-science. We've always been pro-medical. And it's one of our greatest strengths in, in terms of the national conversation on dismantling Roe and, and ending abortion violence. And so the more we focus on the child, the humanity of the child, the science behind the child, the technology which has exploded in 48 years, uh, the better we do. And that's why, um, jump in here, Mark, because I'm going to keep going for the next 19 minutes. But um, <laughs> that's why that's why Dobbs is so important. One of the reasons why, because in all these 91 pieces of state legislation, the Texas case is the first it's one. Different. That yeah, and it got out of the federal, got out of the yeah. Let, let, let's hold off on Dobbs for a second because I I, I really want to take a moment here and talk about the Texas case because sure. the difference is, as far as I can tell, and of course I'm not an attorney, although I do play one on social media occasionally. Uh, that the difference is that with the other heartbeat bills, the they did not delay the enforcement mechanism for the criminal part of the bill. In other words, they still ban abortion in Texas, right. but they say the criminal sanctions are delayed until or if Roe is overturned or that portion of the law can be held up in court. But what they allow for, or actually present in the, in the, uh, in the, in the law is what they call a right of private action. So the enfor enforcement mechanism are private citizens who sue in civil court. And this has happened before, but not in the abortion uh, the legislation. This is this is similar to, say, like the O.J. Simpson case in which he was acquitted when it came to the criminal uh, proceedings, but they took him to civil court and he was convicted. So it's a similar kind of thing happening there for people to understand. There's a civil aspect to this law and therefore, that's why it was upheld, at least for now, by the U.S. Supreme Court. In other words, even though they didn't deal with the constitutionality of it, they let it stay in effect. And so this has opened the door for a lot of states to look at this and say, hey, we want to do it here. Uh, we're looking at it in Ohio. And I think that it, it bodes well, as you say, for the upcoming Dobbs case as well at the U.S. Supreme Court, because now... We know at least there are five judges and uh, justices on the Supreme Court that allowed this law to go into effect in Texas, which gives us hope that 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 maybe they will look at the uh, the Dobbs case and overturn Roe. So what I want to do, Pat, is I want to switch gears to that because there's a lot of speculation, a lot of talk. We don't know when the U.S. Supreme Court is going to hear this. Uh, my guess is normally it's generally in March or spring and then the, the, the decisions handed down in June. Uh, you're there in the nation's capital. Uh, let's talk about Dobbs. You mentioned the difference between it and all the other cases that have gone to the U.S. Supreme Court and why it is that many, like myself, are hopeful that this could be the case to dismantle Roe v. Wade. Well, obviously, uh, we just talked about Texas, so there's great hope there. Two, the attorney general for the state of Mississippi did an um, excellent brief. Not only are they considering banning abortions after 15 weeks, but he has asked for an outright ban uh, mm -hmm. or an outright overturning of Roe v. Wade. Right. This is something that we have talked about and have prayed about for years, Mark. The closest we've ever come historically in 1992 with the Casey uh, decision the original vote, uh, to put it in perspective, when you have the oral arguments within a few days, the justices have a preliminary vote just to kind of see where they are. And probably 90 percent of the time that 
preliminary vote is what the final vote will be. But in the Casey decision, um, Justice Kennedy actually voted to overturn Roe, which made it a 5-4 overturning, and he was persuaded afterward with the undue burden. So we have now had to wait almost 30 years, millions of innocent lives lost and women diminished. Now we are at a place where we can, I think, uh, and we are praying, and we'll get into the prayer in just a minute, but the stage is set. Um, again, it isn't rocket science. It doesn't always work out this way. But you could ask, why would the court take the decision if the appellate court um, had uh, banned the uh, 15 weeks? Why would the Supreme Court want to take this if they didn't have something different to say? If they wanted to say, look, a 15 week ban is unconstitutional, we'll just let that appellate court to be, uh, decision stand. But they didn't do that. And right. so they took the case, which is a huge case. indicator. So you have to ask why. Then, sandwiched in the middle of that is Texas. And you know what, Mark? It, it, this isn't always the best way to look at it, but it's uh, an interesting way to look at it, and it does have some merit and validity. The pro-abortion movement is going crazy. That mm -hmm. is, they're completely unhinged. They just had a big demonstration in front of Justice Kavanaugh's house on Monday. Uh, the, Bush uh, the Bush administration, the Biden administration has jumped in. They're actually uh, using, believe it or not, face laws to try to uh, uh, overturn what happened in Texas. I think the pro-abortion movement and America knows that Roe is crumbling. It's falling apart before they're And it's about ahead. time. We're almost on 50 years, the anniversary of Roe v. Wade, and it's about time. We've been waiting for this moment, and I don't want to get ahead of ourselves here but we have to give credit where credit is due, Pat, and that is that uh, President Trump put up three justices to the U.S. Supreme Court. We don't know how they're going to vote on this, but the indications are we could have some hope, and, and Amy Coney Barrett could be the deciding vote in this. Uh, I have my concerns that, uh, as you say, that they're already protesting out front of uh, Kavanaugh's home, and the pressure is going to come on these Supreme Court justices uh, we live in a different time now when you have uh, Senator Sh Schumer directly threatening uh, several years ago in front of the U.S. Supreme Court. I was there. I think you were there with us. I was. Where he directly threatened uh, Gorsuch and Kavanaugh with reprisals if they voted uh, wrongly, in their opinion, on the Hellerstadt case. I can imagine the pressure being brought to these uh, justices, and they are human beings. I mean— they have to face this day in and day out. We have to be praying for the justices. And, and that's why I want to switch gears here a little bit and talk about what's happening in Washington, D.C. The um, United States Supreme Court begins its uh, fall term or this term, if you will, in, on October 4th. I'll be going to Washington to join a bunch of pro-life activists on the 2nd with you, Pat. Uh, there are, you know, I'll be there also for the uh, the opening of the court. Let's talk about what you have going on here on the 2nd of October. Uh, there'll be a lot of people coming from around the country to be part of this event. Uh, this is a, a prayer event that you've got scheduled out front of the, uh, of the U.S. Supreme Court. Let's talk about the role of prayer in all of this. Uh, prayer is critical. I, I think we have to realize, Mark, uh, you and I having been involved in this uh, struggle for human rights and justice for decades. Abortion is a spiritual battle. Abortion is a spiritual issue. The single people often ask me, what is the most important thing that can be done with this Dobbs case coming up? And I, I don't hesitate for a moment to pray. So what uh, we did, uh, Purple Sash Revolution, it, which is a part of the Stanton Public Policy Center, uh, a woman's uh, educational and advocacy group, barring from the courage of the early suffragists, put together this prayer gathering. We felt before the court opened, the single most critical, important thing is to come to God in repentance 
for the faith community, the Christian community, the pro-life community to first realize it has been our silence, our indifference that has resulted in the loss of the 63 million innocent lives. Mm -hmm. And then to petition and to come before God. And Mark, I've been using this quote from uh, J. Sidlow Baxter, and I want to read it because I want to get it uh, 100% accurate. It says, men may spurn our appeals, reject our message, oppose our arguments and despise our persons, but they are helpless against our prayers. So Amen. we're inviting everyone, brothers and sisters, we weren't there in 1973, tragically. We were not there in 1992 for Casey. God is giving us this window of his sovereign grace for us to be there and I encourage everyone, go to purplesashrevolution.com, purplesashrevolution.com, and join us in seeing history through prayer. We can see God shift history, shape history, transform history, and end abortion violence. So it's so going friends, to be like— go, go to, go to purplesash.com. Uh, purple I'm sorry, purplesashrevolution.com. <laughs> Also on my Facebook page and all of my other social media, we have the event page for this event on October 2nd. It'll begin at 2 p.m. It's from 2 to 4 p.m. in front of the U.S. Supreme Court. I'll be there along with lots of other pro-life leaders from around the country. Uh, there'll be people coming in from everywhere. If you live within driving distance, within a one-day driving distance, or you can even fly to, to Washington to be part of this, uh, this is a historic time for our nation. We do be, need to be on our knees in prayer for this upcoming uh, Supreme Court session, which will include the Dobbs case. So you can find out by uh, going to my Facebook page or go to purplesashrevolution.com. You know, Pat, I, I've been thinking lately about we've got 50 years of unabated child killing, the the blood of the innocent run red in the sewers of our cities. And yet, in my view, we still have not come to God in repentance at, at, at the level that's necessary to end the killing. And so I'm, I'm glad that you're calling people to come. But the pulpits of America need to be on fire right now over this. This is the window that we've been looking for that God is open for us to possibly overturn Roe, which could return it back to the states where we actually have a shot at ending it. And so I'm glad you're calling people to Washington. I hope pastors come too. I mean, I know you have lots of folks showing up, but if you can't come to Washington, uh, pastors should be leading their congregations in prayer over this in the coming months. Uh, don't you think that uh, I mean, without the leadership of the church, which out, without the leadership of pastors, we're not going to see abortion end in America? No, uh, we're just not. We're not. And in fact, um, the late Francis Schaefer used a quote that I've used many times, which says this. Every abortion clinic ought to have a sign out in front of it, which says open by permission of the church. And you, so raise, a, you raise a good point, Mark. Our hope, sadly, the pro-life movement has veered away from our connection to faith and repentance and Christianity. And Agreed. so our hope with uh, Stanton and Purple Sash Revolution is this kind of restarting, this calling mm -hmm. pastors. We're delighted. Um, Dr. Uh, Jay Johnston, who heads up the prayer ministry, Watchman on the Wall for Family Research Council, is very involved with this, and he's mobilizing pastors. Our hope over the next few months is to engage the church on this. They are our greatest resource. A good friend of ours, Mark, uh, Reverend Keith Tusi, uh, always used to say this, um, mm. God's plan A for changing America is the church. There is no plan B. So, and, folks, I want you to go to purplesashrevolution.com. Come to Washington. If you're able to come to Washington, come. This is a historic time for our nation. We need people to be on the ground in front of the U.S. Supreme Court on their knees, begging God for forgiveness for the shedding of blood and asking for his favor on these justices who are under immense pressure. This is the biggest case to come before the U.S. Supreme Court since Casey in 1992. I'm not overstating that. And 
you know, initially, Pat, when I saw this, the U.S. Supreme Court take this case, I thought, oh, well, here we go again. They're going to let us down. But, you know, as I read more, and I think you agree with me, that they wouldn't have taken this case if they weren't planning to do something because a 15-week ban is different than anything else they've ever brought or has ever been brought to the U.S. Supreme Court in the last 50 years because it's a ban on abortion. It, it flies in the face of Roe v. Wade. It flies in the face of this whole idea of the viability standard and undue burden. And we're praying that they, they knock the whole thing down and return it back to the U.S. Supreme or, or back to the uh, states where it began. So, folks, go to purplesashrevolution.com. Let us know you're going to come. Or you can check out the event on my page, uh, on my Facebook page. You're listening to your radio activist on the Mark Harrington Show. And I'm talking to Reverend Patrick Mahoney from the Christian Defense Coalition coming to us from Washington, D.C. Patrick, I'd like to give you, uh, you know, I, I've been asking, what's it like in Washington right now? You know, Americans, you know, sat back in horror and saw what happened on the 6th of January. But since then, the the, uh, the government has, you know, overreacted and locked down, put up all these fences and all of that. They're going up. They're up right now. They just it's crazy. They're, they're going back up. Tell, tell me what I know you guys got denied a, per, a permit to pray on September 11 on the, the uh, grounds of the U.S. Capitol. And you also attempted to try to get a permit to pray that the uh, Congress does not uh, repeal the Hyde Amendment. Tell us what's going on in Washington, because a lot of us haven't been there <laughs> this year because they're afraid everything's shut down. What's going on? Well, we're seeing uh, the greatest erosion of the First Amendment and religious freedom and public expression uh, I've ever seen. I'm holding in my hand here. Uh, I didn't know we would do this, but I have it up in the office. We applied to have a prayer vigil at the U.S. Capitol for the 20th Memorial of 9-11. Here, Mark, here's what I wrote on it. So I, I want the listeners to see what was prohibited. A prayer vigil and remembrance for all those who perished on 9-11 and to pray for God's protection over America. Also to pray for Christians, women, and children living in Afghanistan who are facing violence and brutality. That was denied. Right now, you cannot apply for a permit to have a peaceful First Amendment activity on the grounds of the United States Capitol. It's gone from the People's House to Fort Pelosi. Right. I mean, the that. fact of the matter is you shouldn't even need a permit to begin with. I mean, frankly, I mean, you should be able to walk onto the Capitol grounds like you say it is the people's house and be able to have these types of event. The idea of permits, you know, I understand that there's some point behind all of that. But the fact you have to go through all of these, you know, machinations to be able to go to the U.S. or to the U.S. Capitol and pray and then they deny it. Uh, all in the name of, I guess, safety, right? Is that what they're well, saying? Just like with the COVID, they're saying, well, because of public health, we're going to take away your yeah, rights. That's exactly. really what they're using as a pretense, right? They're using actually national security based on January 6th. But here's the thing. We mm -hmm. sued Speaker Pelosi. Uh, we actually filed two federal lawsuits. And in every case, I want the listeners to hear this. Not one, not one piece of evidence was presented that peaceful First Amendment activity or free speech leads to violence or is a threat to national security. So I mean, it goes up without saying that it's peaceful. <laughs> I mean, it's prayerful and peaceful. The pro-life movement is the most peaceful social reform movement, social action movement in U.S. history. The idea that we haven't even have to throw in the word peaceful speaks to how the culture sees what we do. They're the violent ones. We're not the violent ones. Right. Uh, I, I mean, I, it saddens me to see what's been going on in Washington. Um, but, Patrick, we're, we're glad you're there. If we, if we got about a minute left here. I want to wrap this up. Let's talk about what's happening again on October 2nd with the Purple Sash Revolution and the prayer events in Washington. Uh, and then uh, I want to give people the marching orders to get there. Uh, we're praying, we're crying out to God in repentance. Saturday, October 2nd, we're seeking God to move dramatically and powerfully. Also, Mark, on um, Sunday, Father Frank Pavone is leading a national rosary in front of the court. And then we're going to have a worship service right at the Supreme Court, not only praying for an end to abortion violence, 
but celebrating our religious freedom. If you can have a church service in front of the Supreme Court, you should be able to celebrate your constitutional freedoms anywhere in America. Go to purplesashrevolution.com for more info. All right, folks. So take action today. It's purplesashrevolution.com. Make your way to Washington, D.C. Yes. for this historic prayer event in front of the U.S. Supreme Court right before the term opens uh, October 4th. You've been listening to your radio activists on the Mark Harrington Show. To find out more, go to markharringtonshow.com. We'll see you next time. God bless you. God bless America. And remember, America, to bless God. You've been listening to Mark Harrington, your radio activist. For more information on how to make a difference for the cause of life, liberty, and justice, go to createdequal.org. To follow Mark, go to markharringtonshow.com. Be sure to tune in next time for your marching orders in the culture war.